Welcome to another special edition of Calling Mondays. Today with me, I have the amazing Matthew Howells Barbie, who's the Senior Director of Acquisition, and Jackie Chu, previously at Square and also Dropbox, who's now at Uber. Jackie has also a very exotic position at Uber, and oh my God, I am the worst. It's global SEO lead. Global SEO lead for SEO intelligence. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are going to speak about SEO for SaaS companies. And you, of course, have plenty of experience uh, working in-house at SaaS companies. I would like to start the conversation to highlight the differences that we can find when doing an SEO process for a SaaS company versus traditional transactional inventory website type of SEO processes. The, the main overarching thing that you would call out that's a big difference between in, in general with SaaS versus industries like e-com or in, in particular e-com, right, is scale. They're just, they're different. They're different sizes in every aspect, whether it be from the actual size of the websites, SaaS businesses are much smaller. Like you could run an entire SaaS business off like a three page website. Like that, that can happen. You, you can't do that with an e-com store. Right. And like the, alongside that, it's like typically the way people purchase, I would say overall, if I had to like aggregate, like how much search volume you're typically going after on a website level, SaaS is usually much smaller, much more specialized and much more like commercially focused than on the econ side. Uh, but typically the products themselves or the services, whatever that you're doing on the, the SaaS side are usually a little bit more complicated and less transactional when you're thinking about the buying process. So there's often a lot more education that has to be built around all of that. Yeah, so I think the two things for me that really stand out are one, I think the funnel is really long uh, because you're not only focusing on these like product pages, but you're also trying to like educate people or like talk about like their pain points or their security concerns. Like, and especially for like in your case, like a CRM, there's like a lot of friction to changing that. So I think that people, you know, really want to do a lot of research. Um, so you really have to capture them at like all stages of the funnel. So like using a square as an example, yes, of course you want to sell them point of sales, but you also want to capture the people who are talking about like in inventory management or how to take good product photos or, you know, how to bring in more customers. Um, I think the other second really important aspect is yes, the scale is much smaller, but it's also like way more manual for the SEO person. Every single page you need to give attention to. So you're really working cross-functionally with, you know, everyone from engineers and product managers to like PMMs and copywriters, legal brand design, all of these people, like every single page you make, you have to be super intentional and it's customized. Um, for the keyword that you're generally targeting. So I think that for me, those are like the two really uh, big things. What are the tactics that you have found particularly useful for this type of scenarios? In this case, I can definitely see how content support is critical. I can't imagine how in many cases, there are also restrictions on resources and how much you can end up getting in and then being able to compete with many content focus websites, aggregators, guides that have long form content, just, you know, clarifying every single feature that you may have versus your competitors, right? How, how do you do it? How do you prioritize? Yeah, so one of the things that um, I think is really unique to SaaS companies is how the help center plays a role in both the acquisition as well as the like retention process because, um, for, like again, going back to the idea that like SaaS companies, there's a very long like life cycle. I noticed like help centers actually tend to be like a major touch point for people before they activate. And I've seen that really across like industries um, just because, you know, a lot of times we think about a product page, it's like beautiful, it's light and lean, but it doesn't really have a lot of the meat that somebody who's like really seasoned is looking for, right? They're looking for very specific features or very specific, like, you know, tax um, implications. And so, so help centers are really interesting because they also just tend to have like a lot of content. And to Matthew's point, like, and one end, you need them to rank for all their keywords. Like they need to rank because um, it's also a huge cost to be supporting people to do customer support for, for tools, tasks that are very basic, like how to download the app, which is actually like, those very basic queries are actually tend to be like your number one um, inbound questions. Yeah. But then on top of that too, it's like, you want them to rank, but at the same time, they have a tendency to cannibalize 
the actual product pages themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's like this really careful like dance that you do between those two types of pages. Then that becomes sometimes like exacerbated when there's like community. So like there's always, I don't know if HubSpot has a community. Matthew, yes, that's laughing, yeah, see? So this also happens. So then the solution is always like, let's have a community. People will help each other. But now you have three different parts of your site that are essentially like competing with each other for the same keywords. Um, and so you just really have to, you know, teach people like, okay, there's certain keywords that need to be assigned to each page and like educate other people so that they can help you police like what kind of content belongs where. But it's definitely like a very careful balance because then that's something that I found to be very unique to, to SaaS. It's like the importance of Help Center in like really all stages of the acquisition plan. It really, it really is. And the product marketing is like the heartbeat of most SaaS businesses, right? It's like the, the real art and scale that comes it with content in SaaS is the ability to like master repurposing information. It's like you have information that comes from like the product managers around specific areas of the product. That information then needs to be dissected and be used in like product page like materials. There needs to be uh, like uh, content that's used within that around some of the more informational stuff, the knowledge base information, if you're answering stuff within the community. And all of this has to be really, really well mapped into the search landscape so that, yeah, you're not just going through and competing with every single page that you're producing for the same thing, right? It's like there's a big difference between someone searching for a feature of a CRM because they want to know whether a product that they're specifying in has that feature versus when they're trying to understand what a CRM actually even does and they're, t they're like kind of searching around features. There's such a fine line between some of those things. But <clears throat> I think the thing that I'll go back to what you were talking about later around like aggregators and stuff is probably one of the bigger challenges that SaaS companies definitely face. So you've got like the Capteras, G2s, et cetera, of the world, right? Uh, with and, all of the content, with a lot of reviews also from, from users and being able oh, to yeah. mention everybody in the market that sometimes is something that you cannot do directly because of companies' guidelines and communication protocols, right? Definitely. Well, and it's just like there's a different dynamic, right? I'll compare like a comparison that you can pull towards uh, the e-com space, right? It's like competing with major affiliate review sites like Wirecutter and, and co, right? They're your aggregators, but it's just a different scale because they're so much more like niche focused. So I think the, the big thing that, um, that I've certainly learned over the years of spending in SaaS is knowing which fights to fight, right? It's like, there, there are just certain queries that people are searching for. And I, and I see, this is probably the number one area that I see people just wasting time, resources, cash, is trying to get their product pages to rank for queries that nobody wants a single vendor product page to rank for, right? Like, if I'm searching for the best, like, best CRM software, I'm not actually looking for a page with one product on it. What I, I'm in a stage right now that's way before that. This is like right near the start of the consideration process. And I'm going through and I'm like, I want a big list that I can then narrow down further and further and further. And I think that is a big area where you can shift your approach, right? It's like the way my team at HubSpot, for example, focuses on some of those queries is sure, We'll try and brute force our way into the set, like page one. Absolutely. Like, and that's just like brute force, old school link building and like intent mapping. We're still going to do all of that, but we know it's a means to an end. We just want to be there or thereabouts for some of those. If you're a small startup, don't even bother, right? Like you, you, you're not going to act like we, we have the ability to do that with the resource we have. I wouldn't do it in other situations. The primary focus is, Take everything that is ranking in page one, how can we get mentioned, right? The, the worst thing ever is if people are searching for that, doesn't matter if your product page ranks on page one. If you aren't listed in like those three or four listicles that are all ranking there, boom, immediate breakdown of trust. Why is this, why is this random site appearing in page one, but it's not in all of these lists that people are recommending? You have to be there.
So the way we look at those kind of keywords is less like how are we ranking and more what percentage of the search results page do we own? And we class ownership as like a mention or a feature within any of these. And some of those are paid for, Captera, right? Uh, this is, make no mistake, right? Aggregators is a pay to play space. Like SaaS is really difficult because unlike e-commerce where you could have a lot of things you could rank for, it's such a zero sum game because you're really only selling at most like three, four, five different fundamental products. So you really need to own those SERPs. And to your point, like now there's like even less real estate. Um, so for me, I, the thing that I found to be really successful is uh, automating my internal linking strategy so that like whenever someone creates a help center page or they create a product page, if I can get that internal link um, to point to that product page that I'm actually trying to get to rank for that head term that usually has like a statistically significant like lift on visibility for that for the pages that we target um, Just because again like you really need to make sure like all of that link equity is pointing to the pages that you really really care about And that's probably one of the most important things that I've seen in SAS Stuff. The way we look at things and the way I always try to look at it is in three buckets owned earned, and paid right and basically we have like our, our content that we own. If we can't rank our product pages for some of those queries, can we build out listicles on the blog? Like we, we do this all the time where we'll be like on the HubSpot blog, we'll have the like 11 best like form builder tools. Lo and behold, HubSpots will be in that list, right? Like, but we'll also mention, right? We'll also mention surprise, surprise. competitors yeah. as well. And like, we'll be very open about that, but that's the only way that we're going to actually be in that SERP. And a lot of people get really hung up and they're like, why are you mentioning your competitors? It's like, we need to, we need to be there. But yucky. Um, yeah, and something that I love that you guys said, like much like how you have to kind of broaden your horizon and think about like other sites that are ranking for your queries, like in the way that Captera and G2 do. Mm -hmm. I think as an SEO, like one of the things that I love that like you're doing is you're really into like YouTube SEO. Um, one thing that I've explored quite a bit is app store optimization. I actually think SEO people are some of the best poised to kind of like win those games. Because when you think about people who are doing YouTube, they don't have like the deep knowledge of like how search works in the way that you do. Yeah. Most of the people who do app store optimization, they're actually gamers. Um, and they're like in the gaming vertical. And so I've actually been able to learn like app store optimization, which, you know, really, if I'm being honest, it's just fairly basic keyword targeting, like putting the keyword in the title, put it in the subtitle, put it in the meta keyword slot. But like for something as simple as that, like we would see like an increase of over 25% on like page views for like these really big brands, like, like, you know, the Dropbox and the Square. And that's not going to be that way for like an enterprise client. But if you are a B2B company, but you do like solo premieres or you do like smaller businesses and you have like that offering, there are other ways that people search that you can put your product in front of those people. And I really feel like as SEOs, we are so well poised to identify those places. Thank you very much for talking about that because realistically one of the best examples that i have found of com companies trying to maximize their visibility in non-traditional ways in serps in this space is for example trello or azana mm. they have a lot of how-to videos that they upload in youtube and then when anybody search for how to work with uh, your task management or how how to improve your productivity or how to uh, start following the Pomodoro technique. It is Trello ranking there <laughs> in a video carousel. The visibility so, uh, of that inclusion is huge. And, and this is the type of content that users will prefer to consume in video. It's all about mind share. In, in SaaS, everything is about having as much visibility across everything that you do as possible. Like, the search engine, like marketplaces are way more of an interest to me than just like organic search, like app store, for example, as you were just saying that Jackie, but also I like, I have a whole section of my team just spun up purely focused on the WordPress plugin directory. We built like a, a scraper tool that does like rank tracking of that. And that, and we care loads about that. We were like, we have a huge amount of people that connect WordPress up to their HubSpot marketing like software. And we were like, how do we get a bigger foothold in there? And we looked about two years ago. It was like, all you see when you search for anything is MailChimp. We were like, with, look at all of the mindshare MailChimp have got in the WordPress space. So we built a WordPress plugin and then just went, really heavy on trying to rank in the WordPress plugin directory. And yeah, it's basic stuff like basic optimization. And then everything comes back to reviews. The amount of like 
budget that like I've spent over the years acquiring reviews, just to clarify what I mean by acquiring reviews, uh, spending like dollars on being able to like either reach out to customers or have people at events gathering reviews for our products across different like platforms. Like at our big conference inbound that we, we usually hold each year, right? It's like the, uh, I would have like a team of say like 10 people going around with iPads, getting like reviews on Captera and G2 and stuff because like that is gold. You need to have reviews in all these areas all the way through to our WordPress plugin. I care more about like WordPress plugin reviews than I do links to our product page, right? It's like, it's like sacrilege to say as an SEO. No, no, but, you, need uh, to open, indeed, you need to open at the end of the day. Oh. It's a means to the end. As an <laughs> SEO person, I mean, you can just like, right? Like you're able to see like, what is the pattern of the people who are ranking and almost mm -hmm. always like, like search fundamentally works the same, right? And a lot of these other search engines, whether it's um, in the Apple, you know, the Apple uh, app store, or it's the, you know, Salesforce marketplace, they don't have the years of like engineers and machine learning that like Google does, right? Like Google as a search engine does. So they're really like back how search was in the day. And I'm sure that they'll progressively get better and better and better as time goes on as, as search does, because like you need to get the best result to the user too, which is really important. That's like a lot of what these algorithms do. Um, but it is a really great opportunity, especially because people are searching in like everywhere there, you know, and the, the funnel again is really, 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 really long. And so you want to make sure whether that person lands on G2 Crowd, whether they're looking up for your brand plus reviews, that like you're there and what's being said about you is good. And like as an SEO person, like you just have to make sure that to like Matthew's point, you have really good search coverage because the other thing that's really unfortunate is if people do have bad things to say about your company, almost always someone's going to find it. And if mm -hmm. someone finds it, like it's actually very important to try to do a little bit of online reputation management if that if there is like a negative result that has high enough visibility, like even if you already lost that customer, even if um, you froze their account because they were doing something that's kind of like more like black hat, you need to at least like publicly respond, I think, so that people don't think that you're gonna like leave them dead in the water. Because for a company that is higher LTV too, which any company, anyone who's doing a lot of research and doing a lot of touch points, they tend to be higher LTV. You'll see that usually correlate mm -hmm. with how many times they have to touch your site. Um, they're, one of their biggest concerns as a company is they want to have support. They want to know like if something's wrong, if something's wrong with like, you know, the system goes down, do you have an SLA? Um, where is my money in the case of Square? Like you're going to support them and your, your product is going to be there because like most companies, you know, don't have like a really big like cushion as far as like money goes. And so I think that it is really important to think about like what is the kind of like ecosystem of uh, conversations happening around you. Excellent. So thank you very much to both of you for the insights and actionable tips it has been so valuable. I have learned a lot and hopefully also the audience too. And please, if you have any questions, any comments, leave them out, not here because here is Jackie, but here below Jackie in, in YouTube. And I hope that you have also like to today's uh, episode and very looking forward also to have you in the next one. Please uh, remember to like, the video to subscribe to the channel in case you haven't yet done it so this is me becoming a better youtuber little by little thank you very much until the next episode thank you very much jackie and matthew yeah bye-bye